Foundation series. My name is Dale Yancey. Today we're on lesson number 21, which is God preserved Israel enslaved in Egypt and the providence of God in the life of Moses. So now we come to one of the most remarkable periods in Israel's history, where we will witness Israel's escape from Egyptian slavery, their miraculous crossing of the Red Sea, the establishment of the covenant uh, with God there on Mount Sinai, and their journey to the edge of the promised land. All these ingredients come together to create a drama that's more powerful than the mighty Red Sea, it's more majestic than any pharaoh, and it's more amazing than buying a ticket to the latest concert or movie that's out there. Well, today we live in a society that rewards strength and denigrates or ridicules any kind of weakness that men have. It never gives a thought to the possibility that God could use men who are weak but put their faith and their trust in Almighty God to do things that they could never do in their own strength or power. Many people in our culture today have a vague knowledge of the story of Moses. They've heard bits and pieces, but they've never had a concept of the sovereign God who is really the main character in this incredible true story. In today's lesson, we'll see that God is sovereign and loving as he preserved Israel during their slavery and he raised up Moses to deliver them. But first, let me remind you that you can go to our website, which is foundationstudy.weebly.com and there you can download notes for today's lesson complete notes where you can follow me word by word everything I'm saying is right there in the notes at foundationstudy.weebly.com you can also check out videos of past lessons starting lesson number one all the way up to the present alright well let's look at last week's lesson before we go any further and let's uh, do a review to see if you remember what we talked about in last week's lesson okay in lesson number 20 which was on Joseph and his brothers. Well, question number one, how did Joseph's older brothers react to their father's love for Joseph? They were jealous and they hated Joseph. Two, and what did Joseph dream? Well, Joseph dreamed that he and his brothers were out in the field tying up bundles of grain. And he says, suddenly my bundle stood up and your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before mine. And then he also had another dream he told his brothers about. He said, uh, I had a dream that the sun, moon, and eleven stars bowed down before me. Now, three, what did these dreams mean? Well, they meant that Joseph would be given a position of authority over all of his family. And four, who knew Joseph's future and showed it to him through his dreams? God did. Five, how much of our future does God know? Well, God knows it all. Six, and what did Joseph's brothers do to him? Well, first they threw him down into an old well where he might have died, then they sold Joseph uh, to some Ishmaelite traders to become a slave in Egypt. And seven, what happened to Joseph in Egypt? Well, the wife of Joseph's owner tried to seduce him and get him into bed with her. When her actions were rebuffed by Joseph, she lied about him and he was put into prison. Eight, who took care of Joseph in prison? God did. Nine, and why did God take care of Joseph? A, because Joseph was a sinner he trusted in God and his mercy. Also because Joseph believed in God's promises regarding the deliverer. And finally because God had a wonderful plan for Joseph's life. Well, 10. Who gave Joseph the understanding of Pharaoh's dreams? God did. And 11. What did Pharaoh's dreams mean? That God was making known to the king that there would be seven years of a really very good harvest which would be followed by seven years of drought. And twelve, is God able to do whatever he wants to do even in places where the people don't know him or worship him? Yes, God's able to do whatever he wants to do because he's almighty. Thirteen, how did God fulfill the dreams which he had given to Joseph when he was a youth? The Lord gave Joseph wisdom to interpret the king's dreams so that Joseph would be given the position next to the king. And fourteen, why did Jacob take all of his family down to live in Egypt? A, because his son Joseph was down in Egypt, and because there's plenty of food in Egypt, and because the king invited Jacob to live in Egypt, and because God had planned for all of this to happen. And finally, 15. What were Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's descendants called? They were called the children of Israel, Israelites, or Israel. And finally, 16. What motivated Joseph to act as he did? It was his faith in God. 
Well, when the curtain closes on the book of Genesis, the Israelites are prospering there in Egypt through the esteemed position of Joseph, who is Abraham's great-grandchild and Jacob's favored son. When the curtain opens on the book of Exodus, time has passed and the tables have turned dramatically. The descendants of Jacob's 12 sons, who now make up the 12 tribes of Israel, they find themselves languishing in slavery. And making matters worse, a population explosion among the Israelites concerns the Egyptian Pharaoh, who orders that all the Israelite newborn males be killed. So let's pick up the story by reading what Hebrews says about the man called Moses. By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents, because they saw that the child was beautiful, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. And by faith Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he is looking to the reward. And now we come to A, the uh, introduction for today's lesson. And in this study, we begin the second book of the Bible, Exodus. And Exodus means going out. And this book records how God took his people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And as we study this amazing story today, let's keep in mind these things. First, remember that the Bible is a true history. The events of Genesis and Exodus are mentioned many times throughout the Bible in both the Old and the New Testaments. And many of the minute details of Genesis and Exodus have been confirmed time and again by archaeological discoveries. And second, keep your eyes on what God is doing. You're going to learn a great deal about God from this book. Just as our actions reveal our character, so also God's actions reveal His character. Third, remember that God is the same today as He was in the time that this story took place. He never changes. You see, God is still holy He's all-powerful, all-knowing, he's faithful, and he's sovereign today. Now read with me Genesis 50, verse 26. So Joseph died, being 110 years old. They embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. And Genesis 12, 3. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And Genesis 28, 14. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. We come to B. Israel increased in number and in riches. So Joseph and all his generations died in Egypt. Joseph, his brothers, and their families continued to live in Egypt after their father's death, even though the drought had ended. They did not return to the land which God had promised to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Bible says that Joseph and all his generation died in Egypt. Now, about 350 years have passed between the time that Israel came down to live in Egypt and the time that their story picks up here again in the book of Exodus. And Israel had been living in Egypt all that time. Illustration here, the map that shows you Egypt, or its location on the map uh, in relation to uh, Canaan or uh, Israel. So you can see uh, where it's located. And it's still there today. Egypt hasn't moved at all. It's still in the same place. Exodus chapter 1 verse 6. Then Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. So the children of Israel, they prospered there in Egypt. And their numbers increased rapidly. They also became very rich. They had many cows, goats, and sheep, and there was plenty of grass for the animals, and the Pharaoh was very good to them, but things were soon to change. We come now to see the new Pharaoh's evil plans. And the theme here is Satan fights against God and his will. Satan is a liar and a deceiver. He hates man. Exodus 1.8 says, Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh's store cities of Pithom and Ramses. Now, who do you think 
was guiding Pharaoh in his evil plans. Of course, Satan. Satan was behind all the Pharaoh's evil plans because Satan hates both God and man. Now, why would Satan want to destroy the nation of Israel? It's because Satan knew that God had promised to send the deliverer who would destroy Satan and deliver man from his power. Satan also knew that God had promised that this Savior would be born through the nation of Israel. And Satan knew that the deliverer would be a descendant of Abraham. Satan wanted to destroy the nation of Israel because they were the people of God chosen to fulfill his plan in the world. Satan didn't want anyone to be delivered from his power and from the righteous punishment of God. Now we come to Exodus 1 verse 12. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. The Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel, and so they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves. And they made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick, and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. And then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was Shipra, and the other was Pua, When you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, you shall kill him. But if it's a girl, she shall live. Well, the story of Moses' birth takes place amid tragedy. A king or a pharaoh has arisen in Egypt who is threatened by the Hebrew people. Even after the Hebrews were forced into hard labor, Pharaoh is still troubled. We don't know exactly why. Maybe it's just their sheer numbers. There's so many of them, such a multitude. Perhaps it was the Hebrews' faith in their almighty God. Perhaps it was their tenacity of their spirit. Perhaps it was their obvious and unwavering confidence in the Lord of history. Pharaoh may have been an emotionally insecure man. The storyteller wants us to understand that the number of Hebrews was sufficient to threaten those in power. So the result of all this is, the Pharaoh issued a terrible decree. He ordered that all the male infants of the Hebrew women should be thrown into the Nile River and drown. His executive order was given to the Hebrew midwives, and the midwives, however, refused. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives, and he said to them, Why have you done this, and let the male children live? And the midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous, and they give birth before the midwife can even come to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. The Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. The midwives, however, refused. They simply could not or would not comply with such a command. So Pharaoh called them before him in the palace. Why have you done this, he cried, and allowed the boys to live? Well, the midwives used clever tactics in their response. They replied, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. They are vigorous. They give birth before the midwives even come to them. Now, in effect, these Hebrew midwives lied to Pharaoh. They created a story to provide cover for what they were doing, which was allowing the Hebrew baby boys to live. Now, how can God condone a lie? Well, there are lies, and then there are righteous lies. See, here's a situation where a lie arises out of doing a righteous act which is preserving the life of the innocent Hebrew babies. And this is very similar to the lies that German and Austrian believers used when they were hiding Jews in their homes to protect them from being slaughtered by the Nazis or sent off to concentration camps. When the SS would knock on the door of the homes of these believers who were part of the resistance movement against Hitler and the Nazis, they would lie and say that they did not have any Jews living in their household. We also have the example of Rahab, the prostitute, who along with her entire family was saved by God because she hid two Hebrew spies who had been sent by Joshua. And when she was asked about this by the king of Jericho's men, she lied to them and she told them that the spies had taken off when in reality the spies were hidden right there in her house. She actually lied twice. And yet she is praised for her faith in the Bible, in the book of Hebrews, and in the book of James. Well, getting back to our story of the Hebrew midwives lying to Pharaoh, 
we are told, so God dealt well with the midwives. See, God looked favorably upon these family servants. The message is clear. Sometimes it's important for people of God to be shrewd. The Hebrews lied to Pharaoh because they feared God more than man, and God blessed them with families. This frustrated Pharaoh, and it led him to employ even a more direct strategy for the elimination of the Hebrew boys. Then the Pharaoh gave this order to all of his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw him into the Nile, but let every girl live. Well, as you can see, everything is going wrong for Israel. I mean, they had come to Egypt filled with confidence and assurance of God's promises, but soon they found themselves living in harsh slavery and under the ruthless oversight of their Egyptian taskmasters. Even worse than that, a Pharaoh who was unfamiliar with Joseph had mustered his entire nation against them. The Nile was about to become the graveyard of Israel's future. Now just pause and consider what Israel's mindset must have been at that moment. I mean, the children of promise were now slaves to a foreign king. They must have been asking themselves questions like, Where are you, God? And why is all of this happening to us? Well, if there had been a 24-hour cable news network like Fox News in those days before Moses' birth, the headlines that would have been flashing across the screen might have sounded something like this. Hebrews continue in slavery. No end in sight. Hebrew sons to be tossed into the Nile. And God's promises, fact or fiction. In other words, things were very bleak for the Hebrews, and they knew it. But even at this bleak moment, the hand of God's providence was at work, planting the seeds of a plan that would eventually blossom to the redemption of his people and fulfillment of God's promises for them. And now we come to D, Moses' birth, three women and a baby. And the theme here is, man must have faith in order to please God and be saved. And here you see Moses on the chronological chart, okay? So, I mean, we're talking about a real person in history, all right? Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. And when she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes. She daubed it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in the basket and placed it among the reeds by the river bank. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. The parents of this child trust in God to take care of their baby son. And now we come to E, the providence of God, the invisible hand of God. And the theme here is God is faithful. He never changes. Exodus chapter 2 verse 4. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her young women walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman, who, and she took it. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. And then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes, go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. And when the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, because she said, I drew him out of the water. Now I just want you to consider this extraordinary chain of events that really is the providence of God that preserved Moses' life. First of all, his mother hid him for three months, which was against the law. And when she could no longer hide him, she puts him in a basket among the reeds of the Nile on the exact day and time and at the exact location that Pharaoh's daughter is coming down to bathe. And Moses' sister just happens to be watching all of this and happens to think of a great plan to su suggest that the, there's a Hebrew mother that can nurse the child. On top of all this, Pharaoh's daughter, in direct rebellion to her father's decree, felt pity on Moses and adopts him into the most powerful house in all of Egypt. Moses was supposed to be dead, but instead he grew up in the house of the leader whom, through God's power, he would one day bring to ruin. Here's the other thing I want you to see, the invisible hand of God. It, it's so amazing that Moses' mother sets him in a basket there in the Nile River, and so he's in this basket flowing down the Nile River. 
he could have got caught in the bull rushes anywhere along the way and never made it to where Pharaoh's daughter was bathing. He could have been attacked and eaten alive by a, a crocodile there in the Nile River that they, they hung out along the banks of the river. And so all kinds of things could happen. His basket could have tipped over, uh, hitting a rock or something, and tipped over and the baby could have drowned. All these things could have happened, but no. God predestined, God ordered, God planned that this baby in a basket would float down the river and, and at the exact moment that Pharaoh's daughter is coming out to bathe, that she would see the baby in the basket and ask one of her uh, may, handmaids to go and, and get the basket. And then this little baby starts crying and she takes pity on him. And then Moses' sister is right there and comes up and says, Hey, I know someone who can uh, take care of this baby for you. And she goes and gets Moses' mom to take, take care of Moses. So she gets to take care of her own baby. Plus, Pharaoh's daughter says, I'll pay her. So now Moses' mom's getting paid to take care of her own child. How, how cool is that? How great is that? Again, that's the invisible hand of God. That's what we call the providence of God. And the same God that was working in Moses' life there in Exodus, he's also working in your life and my life today behind the scenes. And that's the providence of God. It means God's at work in all these things that are going on in your life and my life, even when we don't see him or can't, can't see what's going on, we don't know what's going on, God is still at work accomplishing his plans and purpose. Now we come to F. Moses was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. See, God used Moses' courageous sister and even Pharaoh's daughter to protect Moses. And then God returned Moses to his own mother to nurse him until he was old enough to be sent back to Pharaoh's daughter. And God planned to use Moses to deliver the Israelites from slavery. And God knew that Moses would be safer in Pharaoh's house than anywhere else. God also knew that Moses would learn many things that would be important for him to know for his future work as the leader of his people. And the theme here is that God is supreme and sovereign. You see, God is greater than Satan. He's greater than anyone or anything. And no one or nothing can stop God from uh, doing whatever he plans to do. Now we come to Acts 7.22. And Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in his words and deeds. Romans 8.28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. You see, he continues to carry out his plans even in adverse situations, and he works through these situations to bring about good for those who trust him. God has all wisdom, and we can trust him. He cared for his people Israel even while they were in bondage, and he cares for you as well. Each of us needs to understand God's word so we'll know what God has done to deliver us from the power of Satan and to bring us back to God. And now we come to G. Moses runs for his life. In Exodus 2.11, One day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people. He looked on their burdens. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and told him, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. When he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together, and he said to the man in the wrong, Why do you strike your companion? He answered, Who made you a prince and judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid, and he thought, Surely the thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. So the Israelites were held captive by the evil Pharaoh, and they couldn't escape. And Moses tried to help them, but he failed. See, no human being could release his people from the wicked ruler of Egypt. Only God could help them. But Moses fled Egypt, and he ended up in the land of Midian. Now what I want you to know is, well, travel time from Egypt to Midian would take 268 hours and 45 minutes if you were in a car and you're averaging about 60 kilometers per hour. Travel time, if you had to walk, would take you around 1,343 hours if you continually would walk at a speed of 6 kilometers per hour. Well, because the public roads were watched, Moses took flight through the deserts where his enemies could not suspect that he would travel. And though he was destitute of food, he went on. And when he came to the city of Midian, which lay by the Red Sea, 
he sat at a certain well and he rested there. See, here, here's what I want you to know. Moses here is in the perfect will of God. He, but he's running for his life and he's traveling through the desert and he's destitute, he's hungry, he's tired, he's weak, thirsty, and yet he's still in the will of God. God's hand is upon him. God is directing his steps. But what I want you to see is that even though he's in the perfect will of God, it isn't easy. Things aren't, I mean, he's, he doesn't have an abundance of food. He doesn't have all the water that he wants to drink. Uh, he doesn't have all this energy. He's tired. He's weary, thirsty, and hungry. And yet he's still in the perfect will of God. Well, we'll pick up the story of Moses and how God called him to deliver Israel in our next lesson. That's lesson 22. God calls Moses out to deliver his people. But now let's review today's lesson to see if you understood what we're talking about, okay? Why did the Pharaoh of Egypt make the Israelites slaves? Because they'd become more in number than the Egyptians. The Pharaoh was afraid that the Israelites might join with the Egyptians' enemies to fight against them and take control of Egypt. Two, who was guiding the king in his wicked plans? Satan. And three, why would Satan wish to destroy the Israelites? Satan knew that God had promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that one of their descendants would be the deliverer. Four, how did Pharaoh try to destroy the Israelites and keep them from increasing in numbers? He ordered the midwives to kill all the baby boys that were born. 5. Did the Hebrew midwives obey his command? No. 6. Why did the Hebrew midwives not obey Pharaoh's command? Because they feared God more than Pharaoh. and They knew that it was an evil command that should not be obeyed. 7. Did the Hebrew midwives lie to Pharaoh? Yes. 8. And what was God's response to what the Hebrew midwives had done? The Bible says God dealt well with the midwives and gave them families. 9. What is the term that describes God's oversight and protection working behind the scenes to accomplish His will? The providence of God. 10. Give examples of the providence of God here in this lesson concerning the baby Moses. Well, I'm sure you can. I went through it with you. How uh, his mother set him the basket there in the Nile River and how God arranged for Pharaoh's daughter to come out for to bathe that exact moment that uh, the basket with Moses was floating by there in the Nile River, and that Moses' sister just so happened to be there and suggest that uh, she could find someone to nurse the baby and raise the baby. And so she brings Moses' mother into the picture, and Pharaoh's daughter says, well, I'll pay you to take care of this baby. So Moses' mother is being paid to take care of her own child. All these things were part of God's providential hand. Now 11. Why did the Lord allow Pharaoh's daughter to adopt Moses? Well, to protect Moses from the evil dictator of Pharaoh and to be a witness to the Egyptians of the sovereign hand of God, which could reach down and insert himself into Pharaoh's household. And 12. Can Satan, any spirit, a human being or anything hinder God from doing what he plans? And the answer is no. Well, that's it for today's lesson. I hope you uh, got a lot out of it and enjoyed it. And it's given you a lot to think about, uh, especially for me, the providence of God, the invisible hand of God, that it's just so comforting to know that whatever's going on in our lives, that God is still at work behind the scenes. Uh, the curtain has been pulled down, and you may not be able to see what's going on, and yet God is still at work in your life, uh, working out His will and His good pleasure on your behalf. Well, until next week, this Pastor Dell saying, May the shalom, blessings, and peace of God be upon you and your family, and I'll be with you again next time. Bye.